All right, uh, my you, you okay, Danielle? Um, I'm abstaining. Okay. Was... Yep. I'm just going through the roll call. Peter, Jesse, hi, Tulani. Uh, can I abstain because I wasn't here? Yep. Amen. Hi. Kay. Hi. Jada. Hey y'all. What's going you, uh, on? Did you yes, read love. the minutes? Did you read the minutes from last month? You want me to read them? No. Did you read them and did you do you yeah. approve them? Oh, of course I do. So yeah, so good. yay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Sorry, guys. You're good. I think we can move on and minutes approved. Great, thank you. Up next, we have Kim Carlino's traffic box design proposal, which Brian sent out to everyone. It's the Sunburst <clears throat> Over State. Quick, quick question before we move on. Uh, is there a link to the letter? I don't see it in the in the um to doris's the doris's yeah is that i can there? put it in there we just got it today so i can put it in there i'll make that i'll make a note of that okay i'll put it in there i'll put it in there as a pdf in the document into the same folder for this meeting sounds good thank you thanks jesse um so kim carlina reached out this is a private commission uh I don't know if you're familiar with this box. It's at a new uh, intersection that's at State, and it's like the back way to get to King Street. What is that cross street? Does it say on there? State and Finn. So this is what it's going to look like. Can everybody see my screen because I'm sharing it? OK. Uh, it is being commissioned uh, by a private citizen who actually gave the city the land to put the traffic box on. Um, and he's commissioning Kim to paint it. And I kind of like help guide the process of how to, you know, get this, this proposal to us and make sure that we're okay with it. So no city money, it's private money, private commission. It is city property. Um, we did get permission from the DPW to do it. So I'd like to open up this design proposal for discussion amongst the Arts Council. The person who commissioned it used to own the land and then gave the land to the city? Yes. So is there a, a residence or there, there are private residences around? Yeah, if there's, there are, it's a private, it's like there's all, it's he's a law firm there's some commercial and then there's some private residents there are a lot of multi-family houses do we ever like when we're doing i feel like whenever we do public art in the city it's like attached to commercial properties do we ever mm -hmm. like talk to the i mean i know there are residents on main street do we ever like talk to them or is it just like kind of in the public uh that's a there's different ways to to, to put murals up one of them is a community engagement process um and this one is public property it's not private sometimes they do if it's like a big commission like there is like the sculpture that we did with david teeple that's on the side of the bridge that faces roost and is was there there was a really big you know public engagement process but that was a i think that was like a fifty thousand or thirty thousand dollar commission i don't know and it's like you know prevalent so n we didn't do it for any of our traffic boxes downtown. Um, it was like privately, like, you know, it, it was not privately, but there was people on a, like a public art commission that would pick the artists with uh, like, you know, like an open call and then have them paint. So this is like definitely a new precedent of having like a 
you know, a local citizen didn't like the black box that started, to get, that was like a brand new black box that was ugly that started to get tagged in front of, in his neighborhood. So that's, I think that's where this um, idea came from. Would he be in charge of, um, or like responsible for paying Kim to touch up the box or fix it as needed or? I, it- I, I mentioned that to him, yes. So there's no, there's no memorandum of understanding. There was a conversation on the phone. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions about this particular or any more discussion? I think it looks better than not having it and it's fitting that the person that donated the land gets to just sort of pick a design for the for the paint. Um, yeah, I, I have uh, nothing against this as an idea. Brian, do you see any possible like ramifications down the line of having a precedent that a private person is commissioning something that is like city art. I know we we do that, right? Like with the bike path project, we did that. But if it's a new precedent, is there do you see the, any the precedent is well the the DPW still has final say on any like city owned property. So they're like, you know, there has to be like, you know, Donna, the director of DW would still have to have the final say with it. Um, I don't, you know, I couldn't think of another scenario besides like beautification of this. There's no city money being spent. You know, I do think that maybe we can, I can offer advice to Kim and uh, Alan Burston about maybe shopping the design around to like people in the immediate area to see if there's any, you know, you know, big outcry of we don't want that there. That's something we can advise on. Um, But I, I, I just don't know another scenario where this would be You know, I would take money from anybody who gave me money to do a mural as long as it, you know, if it was over a certain and then we got to have like people in the arts council involved with curation or, you know, the the big mural we're doing on the, the, is kind of the opposite if you want to go on the full spectrum, which is like fully community, full community engagement. Um, Just the the price of that is higher if you want to get somebody that has like training and like the time and energy it needs to do to do grassroots community engagement and and feedback and that stuff. So that's why the price tag for it is about $17,500 to do that mural in the parking garage. Um, I think this is going to be what she, what is it, $400 to paint the box. Next time I tell her to put the before pictures too, so you can kind of get a a better idea of what it's going to look like. I'm slightly concerned about the medium. Mm-hmm. Uh, the acrylic paint on one of those metal boxes is not going to be very long lasting. Mm-hmm. It's gonna it's gonna degrade rather quickly, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think they Older. should up. They should ask for a better paint that's more durable it's it's not going to just peel off in like a year or two what about a ceiling ceiling. i think the problem is still the latex paint over top of what's probably an industrial grade paint already it's either powder coated or it has uh, an industrial grade paint you can't just Mm -hmm. put latex on there and expect it to stick a lot of those services are meant to not accept pains so yeah no it's true well you gotta you gotta um what we did for the first time we did the the project is we like took a like a you know kind of a, a crazy what do you call it sander to the surfaces so the paint would stick uh in the downtown boxes 
Oh, so and... but we've used latex paint in the past on these boxes? I don't know exactly, like, because I never painted a box. I just primed them and pr prepared surfaces. Uh, there's everything from spray paint. I know, I know there's oil paint. I think well, we I just let... In, yeah, that in an oil-based paint or a, some kind of non-water-based paint would probably work better. That's just my concern. Th this That's will a good concern. quickly. It would degrade. I, I fear that it would degrade, degrade quickly. I think Especially you're right. The color scheme, it's not very bright or vibrant. So those colors are already kind of. Uh... I think so. Here are my. I think the reason they're using this paint because there's leftover paint from another project. And that's why the cost for the artist is so low. There's no materials cost. So if that is a concern, I'll definitely raise it with her for like the. Because I don't know if she's ever, she's never painted a box before. So she's only painted blocks and then like she's the one who did the mural that's on um, Cracker Barrel Alley, the one that goes walk goes down towards uh, Iconica off of Main Street. So, um, you know, I can, I can discuss with her because we're getting a bunch of paint donated by Royal Ta Talons for the big committee mural project. So maybe they'll donate some paint to make this better. So I think that's a legitimate concern, Peter. So Pete, so thanks for raising it. I don't know much about paint, so. Brian, we've, there are boxes that have been around for at least three or four years, right? At this yeah. point? So but I couldn't, there... I couldn't tell you what kind of paint is on them. Like I, I could tell you, I know the one in, Flor in front of Florence is oil because I know the artist really well. And I know the, the paint she uses and I could tell you which ones are spray paint, but I couldn't tell between like acrylic and another other water-based paint. You know, I wouldn't, couldn't really tell or if it's like marker I know there's so many different ways to, to paint now. So, um, so there hasn't been like a, a recommendation that we've been using. Uh, there is, I just can't remember it off the top of my head. I can go dig into my drive right now and, and, come up with it because like when we first started doing benches and stuff I definitely did a bunch of research with some artists and that was but that was like eight years ago at this point so um but these are these are good concerns and I'll, I'll just I think we can discuss it and bring these like bring the community engagement piece at least like maybe we can have them post the proposal on the sculpture on the traffic box for a couple weeks with some kind of way to have the, their neighbors or the people that walk by get some feedback in before they decide to paint it. And then I think discussing it with Kim, like, do you know if this is, cause she's, she does this professionally like around the country. So I think having a conversation with her to see, have she ever painted industrial grade metal or with specific surfaces with this type of paint, I think, I can talk to her about that and bring it back to the council or email you my findings. Um, but Kim is very easy to work with and flexible and open to any input that we give give her. Um, Ryan, could we also approve the concept and design and just make the recommendation of and trust and trust the artist to make? Yeah, I would. I you know I've had not. I, I think that like I said, I've worked with Kim. She was she's actually helped public art in Northampton a lot. Um, when she first started working with us, she, she, she worked for, vo volunteered a lot of hours and did a lot of work with the planning and uh, sustainability department um, and has done a lot of really great work in our town. So I, I had nothing but good things to say about her. Or she advises us. Um, I call her, text her, and just because of her portfolio, I definitely think she'd be more than happy to to do any of the recommendations or offer and, if, and I can email her and then I can share the findings through email with the council. You just can't, you couldn't reply to it or reply all. You can email me directly and then we can, whatever we need to discuss at the next meeting we could, but I definitely think we could approve the design and concepts and then with recommendations of um, a, a deeper dive into like a longer lasting paint and then a way to the they can figure out that Alan and her can figure out how to engage the community a little bit with to get some feedback.
Are there any more comments or questions or concerns? Are there any other like city permits that they need to get in order to do this work? There's no formal permitting process. This is the this is the form we're you're looking at the formal process to get art, which is going to last for more than 90 days in the public view. So there's one, you know, thing on the books in Northampton that was passed about 10 years ago, and this is the process. We could help, you know. We did some work on the side. We could start a permitting process. I can share a doc that I've created to help guide people about public art. But basically, the long and the short of it, Garrett, would be what do you want to paint? Who owns it? What's the design? Send us the design. We all look at it and we say it's art and that's okay. You know, that kind of thing in general. But I can share a link right now to our website where we have that up. I'll put that in the chat right now. I'm fine with um, Danielle's proposal of approving the concept and design and trusting Kim to kind of follow through with community engagement and medium with conversation or with communication with Brian. Yeah, I'll, I'll reach out. I to second her that. Is that a proposal? I mean, is that a motion? Because I no, that wasn't a motion. I didn't think I could actually say that all the way through in a motion, but I realized I just did. So traveling. <laughs> <laughs> have any communicate anything that they want to say about this otherwise i can turn that into a motion okay motion to approve uh concept and design um on uh conditionally kim carlino's traffic uh, kim carlino's traffic box design proposal uh conditionally um with comments to kim to follow through with community engagement and check on, on the medium used to ensure long lasting um, existence. Durability. Durability. <laughs> uh, and she'll be in communication with Brian uh, who will then pass that information on to um, the rest of the board um, on which if we have any more comments, we can follow up at the following meeting. I'll second that. Uh, I'm going to just do a roll call on how I see everybody in my uh, my little Zoom screen. My, you're at the um, top. Yay? Yeah. Yeah. Danielle? Okay, I got a yes. Garrett? Yay. Yay. Pete? Okay. Yay. Tulani? Yay. Amen? Yay. Jada? Yes. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we can move on to the next portion of the agenda. Anyway, want to take the lead on this? Garrett and or Jesse? With the poet and youth board laureate updates? Um, I, I guess I should mention that you and or Brian and Jesse and I met at a coffee shop a couple weeks ago and sort of discussed um, the approach here. And um, one of the main things that came out of that meeting was the decision to elect a po poet laureate before we elect the youth poet laureate. And the reasoning behind that was that we really wanted the poet laureate to be able to play a role in choosing the youth poet laureate because a lot of that appointment or a lot of the benefit of that appointment involves the poet laureate mentoring the youth poet laureate. So um, we thought it'd be beneficial for the, I, I'm just gonna start abbreviating for PL and YPL. Uh, we thought the PL would like to pick the person that they're going to mentor because maybe they have similar uh, you know, approaches to the medium or um, maybe they have similar subject matter that they wanna talk about. So um, the intention now, I guess, is to, 
award the uh, search for and then subsequently award the, po the PL before we um, move forward with a YPL. Um, so with that being said, Jesse, do you have uh, updates about the PL search? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, as I try to talk and type at the same time, um, the I have a uh, group of three individuals who have agreed to um, choose the poet laureate. Uh, we are in the process of whittling down names uh, currently, um, and then we're going to uh, meet. Um, to vote on a, uh, a short list, uh, and then we're going to reach out and um, be in touch with uh, the short list poets in order of preference. And hopefully one of them will uh, agree to be the Poet Laureate. Um, this is taking longer than I was hoping, uh, but fingers crossed, I'd love to have this done in the next two weeks so that we can actually move forward with the Youth Poet Laureate before school is out, which was kind of the goal, um, though I don't know how realistic that is at this moment in time. That's actually um, something that I wanted to bring to the table today, actually, because I've uh, heard from, you know, a community, I've reached out to a handful of community members about being a part of the YPL search. And um, one of them voiced her concern that we just don't, it's not a good time of year to pick um, a youth poet laureate because of school ending and everything. And it'll be really difficult to sort of, or it'll end up being like sort of a quick truncated process, or um, it'll just not, it might not be enough time to just get everybody to focus on it. Um, so I guess it depends what the goal for the YPL is. And if we want to, I think one of the things we talked about is the, um, unfortunately we won't have one for like summer events if we push it to the fall, but I think it might be beneficial to just like give it the time it needs um, in a time when it's not so like frantic for, you know, kids in school. Um, but that being said, I'm, I'm really open to discussion about that as well. Garrett, did they uh, say when would be a good time or were they just basically saying not at the end of the school year? Yeah, the, the woman I talked to works at the high school and she was like, um, it's just like a crazy time of year right now. <laughs> Cause it's like, you know, it, it's getting close to summer. So there are like final exams and stuff. And then there are kids that are graduating and then going to college and there's just like a lot going on. Um, but that being said, maybe we just, maybe we just like call, make the call and, you know, gather, uh, gather yeah, participants for two weeks or something or three weeks and then and then just make a relatively quick decision and we can have it done by the end of the school year. Um, we don't necessarily, you know, have to make it like a longer drawn out process than it needs to be. We can be sort of lean about it. Um, and that's, you know, the benefit of that would that, we, um, you know, we would probably have the, um, the YPL for like summer events that might benefit from, you know, participation of a youth poet laureate. Um, but that also you know, this shorter schedule um, and picking the YPL sort of depends on the participation of the Poet Laureate as well to help pill, pick that person. So we sort of would just, we would just have to hit the ground running and really do it rather quickly in order to make it happen. But I think it is possible. Um, I saw Jada had um, their hand up, but took it down. I have a question. Danielle also has their hand raised. I don't know who was first. Go for it, Tulani. You sure? I can't see anybody. I'm on my iPad. So, <laughs> um, would it would it be crazy if we decided to do like two truncated? Well, no, it wouldn't be truncated. But would it be weird if we did like a summer poet laureate laureate? And then have like have a school year one as well, and then that like even the summer poet laureate could apply again for the school year. And then that way it gives room for like, because right now I definitely agree. Like I have I have teachers and kids right now who are literally already counting down the last day of the school. We got like thirty five, and 
with that in mind, I, I often think there's always going to be, there's going to be a handful of kids and students who are actually going to want to do something that haven't gotten their stuff together yet, who might be excited to do something just for the summer and then do a longer version for the remainder, for the, for the entire school year from September to June. You're just talking about the Youth Poet Laureate, right? Not just- I'm just talking about the Youth Poet Laureate and our Poet Laureate can be the same person. I, I don't think that's a bad idea. Um, it, uh, I just wouldn't wanna like cheapen the appointment by doing like a, by doing two of them in a school year. But, um, but I, I hear what you mean where like, you know, it's less of a commitment, so it might be kind of preferable for a, a lot of students. I know when I was that age, I always had like a thousand things going on at once. Um, but yeah, it's it's worth a thought, I think. Danielle? So I was actually just going to ask who the committee is that's choosing the regular Poet Laureate and how you came to find those folks and what the processes that they're using to like pull a list together. And then my suggestion on the Youth Poet Laureate front is rather than speed things up, which we know can result in catastrophe, maybe think about really slowing it down and making sure we get the absolute right Northampton Poet Laureate and have that person work really closely with, with you both on coming up with a process where they can do a lot of outreach to, to students in the community, particularly students who might not normally hear about this, particularly you know students of color, to, to make sure that people are encouraged to either apply or be nominated. What is our process for selection? Um, and I guess, how are we like finding the kids? And I think, I don't know, I haven't heard that super clearly yet. Maybe y'all talked about it's it's an application, right? So we want to make sure that as many kids as possible see it. So I think we could do like a whole summer long campaign and have a deadline at the beginning of, you know, the school year and have students apply in mid-September or something and take effect at the beginning of the school year. I don't know, but I think it'd be great to have the poet laureate kind of be a part of that outreach and engagement process to make sure we're really getting the the call for applications everywhere it needs to go. Can I make a comment? I'm sorry. May I please? Go for it. Um, I attended this last year and I'm gonna do it again. I may do my famous hair braiding clinic at the JFK. I don't know if a Port Laureate is a high schooler, middle schooler or not, but on May 18th from five to seven at the JFK lawn, I'll be doing some fun, super fun activities for the, it's called LPAC, which means English Learner Families and I don't know what that stands for, English Learners Families Pack. And so if I could have a flyer or something, what a Port Laureate is, I can see if people are interested. Last year I went and maybe 200 people were there and their families. So um, I get that we wanna do everything right uh, and do it right and invite many people. But I know when I was there, there were, I didn't realize there were so many people from around the world and who were here in this town and their children attended. Um, Northampton School. So if I could be so bold to do something like that, if I got the information, I'd be more than happy. I'll set up a table for my hair braiding clinic and I will pass the word along and see what happens if you could give me a little bit more directives, if that's okay. I think that's a great idea. I don't know, uh, based on May 18th, if we'll have anything but applications available, but- yeah. I'll Karen. send you this letter that I got. So, so you'll know if it's in the invite and stuff, just so you'll know if it's, if, if what we can do. Yeah, that sounds like a really good way to get the word out. Um, just to answer a couple of your questions um, quickly, Danielle, uh, the way that the application process works now or the rules that we've established so far, which are still kind of in flux, but you know, they can be pretty much complete if we want to call them that. Um, and by we, I mean Beautiful myself, because I'm the only one on this committee so far. <laughs> but um, the way that it works is we sort of um, allow for people to uh, apply and provide either five 
pieces of poetry, five pages of poetry, or five minutes of video performed uh, poetry, or any mix of those. Um, and uh, they can either, like I say, submit their own work, or they can be nominated by somebody else. Um, and then, uh, you know, through that process, we will, we have a small committee of people that will evaluate all the work and um, come up with a way to, uh, you know, pick the best and brightest and most promising. Um, part of the, like I said uh, earlier, part of the uh, meeting um, or the result of the meeting that we had at that coffee shop a couple of weeks ago was to determine that we really did want to bring in the Poet Laureate to be part of the process of picking the Youth Poet Laureate. So I've been feeling lately like we don't really have enough time to not only catch kids before the end of the school year, but also to really have enough participation from the Poet Laureate to like do it justice. So, um, you know, instead of trying to do it quickly, I think you're right that we should probably slow it down and just make sure everybody gets, the, the word really gets out there. Like, um, you know, at the, at Joella's um, event that she was talking about, like things like that. If we have a whole summer to get the word out there, that'll be really beneficial. And I think that'll really increase the applicant pool and the diversity of the applicant pool because we'll have a diversity of events. Um, the, my intention was always to go to all of the schools in the city um, and let all of the appropriate teachers and faculty members know about it, because I think they're the ones that sort of have their, their, you know, their ear to the ground when it comes to um, like youth poets. Um, and part of the stipulations, part of the rules of the Youth Poet Laureate is that they must be attending school in Northampton, um, or they could be homeschooled, but they have to be attending school here. So although, um, you know, it, it is obviously important to get the word out in a lot of different venues. I think it's not as gigantic of a pool of people as some of the other, um, you know, competitions and things that we have in the art community around here. It's, it's like, you know, uh, students, it's limited to students of a certain age that go to school in Northampton. So it's not like a massive pool. We should be able to get the word out um, relatively quickly. I mean, having the summer to do that would be really beneficial. And what's the process for choosing the regular poet laureate? They're yeah. not applying, right? They're not submitting. No. Okay. No. So the regular poet laureate is uh, curated, um, and I've gotten, I've reached out to a number of people to get a short list um, from them, uh, and then the we've compiled the short lists uh, along with. Um, Matt Donovan, who's acting as the uh, previous Poet Laureate individual on the committee, since we have to have a previous Poet Laureate. Um, um, now I'm blanking on, on a couple of people's names. Um, anyway. There are there are three people. Basically, we've we've gotten about six short lists together that we've created this long list of, and we're all creating from that long list another short list of five to eight names, and then we're going to meet and talk about those five to eight poets and discuss, you know, where we want to go if anybody is popping out as like a unanimous or. Um, you know, majority interest, you know, we'll kind of do a, a conversation and um, vote from there. Um, and it's still very kind of like all up in the air at the moment. And the names are range from locals to, you know, regional people to national people. So it's not just um, individuals that are that are in this community. Um, but I have a sense that we'll probably stay closer to home when we pick the final person. Do you have criteria for evaluation? Um, not beyond, uh, just kind of taking the, um, uh, the things that we've been doing, uh, that we've been talking about here as kind of the, the base for uh, the beginning and, um, you know, getting our, uh, 
what am I trying to say? Uh, based on what our what the equity um, kind of statement has and all of our discussions around um, purposeful uh, discussions and and choosing people who um, have decided to uh, make their information known. Um, you know, we're looking for for somebody who is uh, of a wide and kind of diverse representation. Um, and for that, you know, I've I've reached out to a number of different communities who have all um, submitted some names that would perhaps otherwise not be uh, not be thought of or available. And I don't have anything, I have not really written down a bunch of stuff that I can reference at this moment, which is why I'm struggling to recall everything because I don't have it in front of me. So I would love to hear what other people think, but I do think it's important for us to really easily be able to answer the question, why did you choose this person? So my recommendation would be that maybe Jesse and Brian and Garrett get together with the three jurors and maybe outline your, you know, three criteria or come up with a scoring rubric. rubric. You can um, adapt from our grant evaluation form. You can make up your own thing. But I do think just in light of the um what happened during the biennial we want to make sure that we have clear explanations as to our like our pool that we're looking at we want to make sure that if there is an outreach component which i know is not for the the regular poet laureate but is for the youth poet laureate we want to make sure we have a really tight outreach plan that we can share and publicize as part of our process um and I just, I just think it would be great if we can even just put online, these are the criteria that we're using to select a poet laureate in the future, right? It's, and we can be as transparent about it as possible. And I don't think anyone is trying to not be transparent. I think it's just like the way these things have gone in the past and we have never really had a clear process around it, but that is my like strong recommendation. And I don't know okay. what others think about, about that level of process but just a thought yeah um brian just uh linked in the chat the recommendations for the northampton poet laureate roles responsibilities nominations and electing election procedure um so this is kind of like the very base thing of what we've done in the past and i think that using the um using the uh, uh, grant information um, on how, we, how we've done that recently, uh, adding that into here is pretty much how we're gonna kind of move forward. Yeah, in this, seeing, like, committee. in this I'm seeing like top candidates move forward, top candidates move forward. So I think just defining what that means and making it really easy and clear for the judges too, right? We don't wanna, put them in an awkward situation of having to like, you know, privilege one criteria over another. So yeah. I don't have has anyone else been involved in something similar where they've had to source like youth submissions and assess? Uh, as far as the development of a rubric goes, um, is that something that can be done prior to involving the committee of jurors, or is it better to allow the jurors to decide that? I would think that maybe you'd want the previous poet laureate to be involved, especially thinking around the the idea of like, what is the criteria around poetry? Like, how are you assessing the actual language? I think maybe that person can provide useful insight, but I would say that the criteria should probably derive from, from the council. And then you share that with judges. You can definitely get input 
Um, Brian, you're, you're back. Are you coming to share wisdom? Yeah, I just, it's like competitive art again to me. And then like, when you start telling people how to score goals at poetry to me, it's like, that's, I understand where you're coming from. So, and I, I codification and like process is really important, but I just can't wrap my mind around it right now. Like, how do you say what poetry is better or how do you determine it? I would love some examples to help inform the process of making that document better. I don't know that it necessarily has to be like what poem is better, but I think it could be which applicant has like writes things that are most likely to resonate with folks who are not normally represented in literature or poetry. What, um, how likely or how interested is this applicant in community outreach or community impact? If part of their role is going to be, you know, talking to the public and showing up at our events, like, do they it's demonstrate? Not, it, but so the, the, there's a difference between when we can change it. I'm just saying currently, like the poet laureate doesn't have any responsibilities. They are, they're told to show up for the inauguration of the mayor, which happens every four years now, which if it's a re-election doesn't matter. But the, the poet laureate can either be engaged or not engaged because that leaves open us to like choose somebody like that's very famous to be the poet laureate of Northampton and not be super engaged. There well, are- Even if fame, if, if like fame and, you know, notoriety within the literary field is an important criteria for us, then I think we should name it. And I think it's fine if the council changes the criteria every year or every- I'm just gonna have to disagree. I think the committee should like, whoever's on the committee, I think we should help choose a committee and then the committee should have different priorities each time. So then there's flexibility within the ongoing uh, poet laureate selection, whoever joins the committee and that's where we're, we're making our selection, right? Not so the and their priorities should make. I think leaving it open is important to just to go with what the committee is feeling, whether they're going to have the community engaged person or whatever is most relevant in the poetry community. Because so go ahead. Can the committee can the committee like decide on priorities? Can like the the three of you plus the judges like actually say? Well, I'm not on the committee. I'm just helping like move the process along. So I'm not choosing anything. So whoever's on the committee can can that group say like these are our top three priorities this year. This is what we're looking for in assessment. Or no, I don't know. Like that's my that's what I was. I mean that that's kind of what I was asking before. Like, is it better to just let the the um, judges choose what they're looking for, and that let the process by which we choose those judges determine? Let, like, I the think way, we should. Way that I, works. I think in the past how it's worked, and it doesn't have to work like that anymore. I just, you know, the procedure is important, obviously. We choose one arts council member and other people from the community, and that committee creates priorities, and then they can name them, right? They can just on the fly. We have our procedures on how to do it, and then we have a post-op report after why they chose that particular poet laureate. These were the priorities this particular round of this poet laureateship, right? Maybe this time they want a community engaged. Like Karen was very engaged in the community. Sometimes we've, we've chosen people that weren't engaged in the community and they didn't have a lot. So I just think to me, the flexibility and we like stay with procedure, almost like the Robert's Rules of Order. So again, like the community can have flexibility and to choose the, what their priorities are. But that's how it's done in the past. And again, I'm just trying to inform past procedure and I like the openness and getting too tied down to certain things from the council side, I think will leave the committee to not have as much input as we would hope they would have. Does that make sense? Am I making sense? Also, it's, I think it's worth mentioning that the reason why we're choosing judges that are part of the community and in the poetry community, and in this case, teachers in the community is because I, I need their input for what to look for because I'm not an expert. And I don't think this this uh, arts council is comprised of experts of people that would know what to look for in poetry necessarily. Um, so leaning on them a little bit to come up with what those parameters are is gonna be really valuable and important. Just to be really blunt and really clear, 
yeah please. last time we did a, a process i am the one who has to be a public voice to what went wrong or what didn't so i just want to make sure that we are really clear about how we're doing things and what our priorities and values are and how it's coming through i don't care what they are i don't care who decides them but i do think that there there should be a way to do that and i may not be the one speaking on behalf of this process hopefully we won't have a reason to speak on behalf of this process but I just want to make sure that the lessons, and maybe I have PTSD from everything that I've gone through on this committee for the past two and a half years, but I just want to make sure that everyone's, our, our process is clear, transparent, equitable, and that we can all speak about it and stand behind mm -hmm. it without any like questions or doubts. So sorry if I'm being a hard ass, but it's coming from like my whiplash, I guess, of, of what happened last time. Well, you know, I think that I agree. I, you know, similar to you, I just don't want to like, for this particular endeavor, I don't want to like be steeped in fear not to go forward and work with this. Um, I think we can learn from some mistakes, um, make sure we keep minutes at all the committee meetings that are choosing the poll laureate. So it's clear. Uh, and then, like I said, follow what we have codified and then make sure within those minutes, like we can have, you know, a post-op report by the committee members of like why this person or these people were the finalists, semi-finalists, what they were looking for and what their priorities were. As long as the committee is, we are like ensuring that they are extremely clearly defining their decision-making process and whether you want to do it with a rubric and criteria at the beginning or an evaluation assessment at the end, I think it's up to, to y'all and the committee to decide, but that is my like strong recommendation is to make sure that we have that content. Yeah, it's just tough because I don't think there's an objectively right answer when you're scoring things. So like, as long as you, as we have things that are, are like sort of goals for what we're looking for in a youth poet laureate, I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm, I just I'm I'm not 100% understanding why um, it needs to be written so strictly. I think if if I think it's fine to have a criteria be I was moved by this application. I think that it's fine, but I mean I'm imagining a parent of a kid who was nominated who's really upset that their kid did not get it and wants to know why and goes to the paper and then we have to come back and defend our process and yeah, I just make like, sure that we have the ability to do that and. If, if y'all want to, if Jesse and Garrett, you want to be the ones to respond to any public comment and any newspaper requests on this topic, then I am so happy to like not say another word about it. But I just, that's, that's where I'm coming from with this. Uh, noted. Noted. Uh, Going to forward those emails. If uh, we have to try to move on and, you know, I guess we can decide not to do this if we're going to just not, if we're going to be with, with their trauma. I guess we're, we're not, we don't have closure either. Well, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it. I'm just saying that we, I'm suggesting, and I would really love to hear what other people think that, that we define our, I know we have our process for nomination and the committee forms, I see that. But how is the committee making an evaluation? What is good poetry? Who is a good poet laureate? And I, we were talking in sort of nebulous terms and saying like, this fits with our equity statement. We can't qualify poetry. Like I hear that, but then how are we deciding? What is a good way to decide? We're not deciding. How are they deciding? They can tell us after they decide or they, while they're deciding. I mean, I, you can, I think it's. Okay. I was moved by this poetry. I was moved by this is a valid reason for why you liked it. You can also say, "I found this didn't relate to this at all. I don't have an opinion." Those are yeah, valid. It's comments. gonna be totally objective. I don't think there's any way to say like, "Well, your son only scored a four point five on this section of the rubric." Yeah, or that would be never terrible. Be a mathematical answer. Like it has to. It has to be objective. You mean subject, subject. Oh, right? Sorry, subjective. It has to be subjective. And yeah, it's, I know when we do the arts 
grant rounds, Danielle, like, you know, one of my biggest responses is like, you don't only got a like 7.1 on the like A and I section. And you, it's like, I don't know if that really resonates with an artist when you tell them that like their score is lower than somebody else's, right? Well, that's why that's whenever we send them those kind of responses, I usually get on the phone and say, you scored the lowest in community impact. So if you want to think about strengthening your application for next year, these are ways to bring community impact into your work. But Maybe you're talking about applying for something. grants. You're not talking about like validity of art, though. You're talking about well, like an application for money. But kids are now applying for this thing, this poet laureate thing. There is money attached to it. There's prestige attached to it. And I think that we need to have a clear reason. I mean, what if I read something or what if someone on the committee reads something and is gravely offended by it? What if someone on and, and decides that they're not going to put that work forward, right? What if well, someone- Well, yours on is one of a, one vote in a committee, yeah. a, a committee of people that were chosen and hopefully the way that we chose the committee was fair enough that it's a diverse enough committee that your vote counts. It's okay for you to be uh, offended by it, but that doesn't mean everybody else would be. That, that's what I'm saying, like the process of choosing the people that are part of the committee will help determine what the committee chooses for a youth poet laureate. And, and our, our process of choosing is diverse representation. That's like the only thing that I've heard so far, right? And, and someone who has experience in poetry and was a previous poet laureate. Yes. Should we not simply vote on the moving nature of the poetry itself, do we need to know anything else about the poet themselves? How come we have to know so much about the poet? It's not just the poetry itself. I don't think we do, but if it's just gonna be about the poetry, are we omitting people's names? Is this a blind submission? Like it opens up a whole can of worms, right? I think yeah, I think there's a difference between choosing a poem for uh, to display as this is this is a poem that was voted best by X number of people versus choosing a person. And we're choosing a person, at least with the poet laureate. Um, so Pete, I, I, I don't think it's necessarily wholly that. I think identity yeah. informs like art especially the eye of the beholder. I don't think, I don't think it's irrelevant. I don't think it's not, I don't think it's irrelevant. I think that the first thing we should, you should do is you should stand back and listen to your poem. And if it, hello, you listen to your poem and if it's moving and powerful, then you maybe learn more about the person. But if the poem is trite and common and not very moving, or you're not moved by it, then you wouldn't put that person or that particular poem forward. And if we're, it's just a normal jurying process here. This is not rocket science. I think we can come up with a few parameters and then you can say whether you're moved or not, whether you felt it was good. It's just a subjective opinion. And I think that that is defendable and a perfectly valid rubric. We don't need to be too specific or too vague, but you know, one or two, maybe a small handful of, of categories or, or things to meet is fine. But any more than that, I think is too much. So what would those criteria be? Are we spending time to develop those criteria now? I don't think now's the time, and I don't think that this is the group to do it. I think that the, the people choosing the poet laureate and the poet laureate should come up with the rubric. But I think it shouldn't be unnecessarily complicated or, or hold up the process. I would, my, I'll make one last comment on this. My strong, strong advice is to do it right, not do it fast. I don't care if we hold, I personally do not care if we hold up the process if if we're not getting it right. So that is my my last thing. And if any, I don't know if anyone else has anything to say, otherwise happy to move on from Poet Laureate. Um, 
so I've been listening and just like trying to like hear everyone's uh, where they're coming from. And I think there might be some middle ground somewhere. Um, I think uh, Danielle is totally right uh, as far as I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, she's trying to apply lessons learned and input received from the last experience that we had. Um, and I know a lot of folks weren't here for a lot of that. So I think she's trying to suggest we really take a look at what we are evaluating on. And I don't know if she's necessarily saying come up with these exact criteria, but we need to have well thought out parameters or criteria, whatever you're going to call them, so that if and when, if, but if there are questions or you know, feedback is wanted or you know, discussion is wanted by the community, we have something that we all feel pretty solid about. Um, and on the other hand, I understand the, uh, you know, not wanting to define how do we evaluate poetry, but I think we can come up with some parameters that will work for everybody that will make us all feel comfortable about our different points of view. But I do err more on the side of uh, where Danielle is coming from. Uh, I think it's best to be, you know, uh, forewarned is forearmed. And I think applying some lessons learned uh, will be very beneficial especially said, since we kind of said we were going to learn from this experience in our future endeavors. Thanks, Eamon. I, I totally agree with that. And I agree with a lot of what you're saying, Danielle. You know, I think that we're, I think that we're, I think that I am moving forward with all those things in mind. It's just very difficult for me at this point to um, succinctly say exactly what they are. Um, so. Hopefully next month, I'll be able to have a better uh, representation of how we're moving in um, the selection committee of the Poet Laureate. Uh, I, I agree as well. I, I think my question from 15 minutes ago stands, though, where it sounded like you were, you were Danielle, you were saying that the, the Arts Council needs to determine what our criteria are. And I was asking if it's okay to let the jurors determine that. Now, if it's like solid, like do they, does it need to be defensible by the Arts Council or can it be something that falls on the jurors for the Youth Poet Laureate? I, th I, don't, I don't think it, I'll leave it to you to decide who defines any kind of criteria if you decide there should be defined criteria. But I think that if there were an issue, it would fall on the Arts Council to defend the process and the decision making. So as right. long as someone in this room can do that and has like whatever content they need to be able to do that, then I think it's fine. And yeah, I don't actually have any preference as to what those criteria are, how many there are. I just think they need to be written <laughs> somewhere that everyone has access to. Right. I think to, if if it were up to me, I, I think that's right. Like we would be the ones to defend it if something happened. Or, you know, um, I think it'd be ideally this group that is assembled would come up with the criteria, and then we then they'd say, okay, okay, our council here's the criteria. And we'd be like, okay, great. Or we could ask any kind of little tweaky questions, and then we'd be like, okay, great. Um, you know, just off the top of my head, I think uh, if we were talking about how do you define criteria for evaluating, it could be. We made sure we had a diverse group of folks. We, uh, you know, were going based on what spoke to people. You know, you can kind of just talk like here are the things we think about when we're looking at and responding to work. And I think that's enough. I don't think we need to get super detailed in what defining what a criteria is, but just kind of outlining uh, who was looking at things and how they were looking at things. And then I think that might be fine. How's she doing? Do we have a nice time together? Uh, yeah. And I think we're hearing about some of what Doris is going on there. But Oops. can I can I say something right quickly, guys? I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt. Can I can you, I say something? Please do. I know you've had your hand up. Okay. Yeah. Um. Firstly, uh, Danielle, you know, I really, I really feel the. I see the. I see what's. I can feel it. What's going on with you? And I. And I know you were part of all the stuff that happened before. So it feels like it's very weighted emotionally and otherwise. 
Um, and I know that for one time, for example, uh, somebody made a, a comment and they were like, oh, I got some new, I don't know, I may have said it wrong, some new people on Vav and, you know, some little colorful addendums, my word, not theirs. And I didn't know who this person was, but I really wanted to talk to that person and say, you don't know me, you don't know my struggles, you don't walk a half a mile in my, in my moccasins before you make such a blanket paintbrush canvas. Um, and then I'm trying to understand what they're going through, what they're saying, but I almost wanted to say, well, come with me and sit and talk to me. Let's be human about this. I realize there's a lot of pain going on. And this woman, when you sent me that letter, I wanted to go hug her and say, how can we work together? And I'm going to say something right now, Brian, if you don't mind, and I'm just going to try not to get emotional about it. But Gary, you were there when we had our committee meeting, right? And we had to meet at, uh, Oh, okay. I have my camera off, and we had to, and and we had to meet at somebody's house that I didn't know. She's a member here, and it was like that six thirty at night. I was going to a neighborhood that I don't know, and I got all of this fear that came from me from growing up in the south. Don't go in a neighborhood you don't know. And I got out of the car and I couldn't move, and I I saw a man I didn't know. I know he wasn't in the meeting, and I froze and I couldn't get out. So I think he said, hey, come here or whatever. And I, I couldn't talk, I couldn't walk. And I get to the door and I'm a black woman who turned white. And I forget the woman's name who was there, our meeting person. She saw me and I said, I'm sorry, I get anxiety going to somebody's house, I don't know. And she just came up and hugged me and held me. And all of us in that group, we were just an audible gasp and I was so embarrassed like I am now crying and feeling weak with this and at that point I was like that's all I needed was a human and after that we had a wonderful meeting I I think I embarrassed Garrett like I do in a funny way but it was a wonderful thing and I was just thinking to myself you know all this stuff that's going on this is humanity I can't I don't know I can't it's not like I won't be able to change the past we're living with some real issues and maybe it's the I hadn't felt that kind of fear since I first moved here, but all the stuff going to a wrong house where you can get killed and all the stuff that's going on here and people hurting people's feelings. I mean, I got I mean, I understand that and and it's real. And uh maybe we could get together and if need be, some of us maybe in a subcommittee could talk to folks too, because I understand people's pain can't solve everything, make all the mistakes ever. And this group may make mistakes a hundred times over. But when that woman came, I mean, she was just, she didn't say a word, but just ran up and hugged me. And all the group there, I think they were afraid to hug, but you could just feel the compassion. And maybe this is where we start because we're going to go through this stuff again and again. I think her name, I'm sorry, I forget her name. I, it just, it took me, how Anna. long did it take me, uh, Garrett, to come down? Was it three minutes, five minutes? Yeah, you're, the name meeting. you're thinking of is Anna. It was Anna, I'm sure it was Anna. I mean, but I'm just saying, guys, we're talking about real people, real situations, people who have historically been hurt, a lot of stuff that's trauma-based. And so I don't know why I said that, but I felt compelled to say this because I don't, I'm not, I'm not that trusting with most folks, and I don't feel that safe in most places. So we're making a lot of mistakes. Perhaps you probably have, but we're trying to do something right here. So anyway, I'm just. I don't even feel like talking anymore. I didn't want to, I didn't even want to say that, but I just felt compelled. And then I'll, I'm done. Thank you so much for sharing, Vegeta. I, I really appreciate your openness and vulnerability. Thanks, Jada. So I think what I'm hearing is that we should slow things down, take our time. It'll be our first time back into this kind of sphere since uh, the biennial. So I, uh, I think that's great. I think that's all right.
Does anyone else want to talk about the poet or youth poet laureate? I'm still very much in the process of finding people to be part of the jury. So if any of you Arts Council members can think of anyone in the community that might uh, enjoy being a part of the selection process, please send the info my way and I'd love to talk to them. That's for the Youth Poet Laureate or for the Poet Laureate? Uh, the Youth Poet Laureate. <laughs> yeah, basically Garrett is doing the YPL, I'm doing the PL, and we've had some discussions, but essentially we're each leading up our own. Are there, are there stipends for our judges? Uh, definitely not YPL. And not for the PL either. I'm going to make a motion that we table this discussion or redefine it for a later meeting and move on to the next topic, please. Yeah, so the next thing on the agenda is Arts EZ. I can talk about that. So we have about seven applicants right now. I've done some uh, outreach and i probably should do some more outreach and i want to just share this with everyone here restricted copy and then i think i sent an email but this is kind of just how to log in and check out people's applications and it's restricted to the council. I gotta actually do some help with that. Would it make sense to set a timeline for when we're gonna evaluate these? Uh, are due before the end of June, right? Yep, they're going to be due May 19th. Our decisions, though, to get back to uh, the right checks before the end of the fiscal year? Yeah, it'll be like, little, the, it starts July 1st, but so did you want to float? You want to do the June meeting this for this, you know, June meeting to review? uh for the first review and then we'll do the week after for the i'll i think i'll be here i'll be back in june yep so first tuesday in june to do the um first review and then the next tuesday to do the allocation or around that time because yeah, i what i need do we need to block more than two hours for the regular meeting? Well, I think we're gonna do the same process as we did for the LCC, where like, it'll be like finalists. So they might be, need a little bit more, but I think we should just stick with the two hour thing because I feel like your eyes and your attention kind of are tough to keep after two hours. So if we need to do more, we can do more and we'll try to shoot for July 1st to get everybody their email saying yes or no. But I think, you know, we have to be flexible with each other because it's summertime and everybody gets really busy around here in the summer. Um, so the deadline is May 19th. I can do a compilation and give you guys, everyone, the, all the, the apps to look at. Uh, that's the process. And then people can send the preliminary scores in. 
I think by the second week, second Tuesday in June, I can get all that pared down and have a nice little thing and people can figure out what they're presenting. I think that's enough time, Danielle. May 19th to like, what is the second Tuesday in June? Well, when, when are our June 13th. period due to you? When's, what? When would our first round of scores be due to you? So let's see, May 19th is next Friday. And then I could probably get all of it done to you on the 22nd. And then give you guys is a week with them too long or not enough or because I can get everybody the stuff on the twenty second and then you can get my the first scores to me like the two weeks the first Tuesday in June. Brian, it looks like two people at least won't be here for the June meeting. Okay, so we're gonna have quorum. Okay, so what about? June 13th, nope, both Tuesdays. We can do a different day. So when in June, we just need two or three meetings. We can do them on other nights. I don't know if that's possible. Um, so we won't have two presenters, right? I don't know. Brian, could you, sorry, I know you just said some of those dates, but could you um, go over the dates again that will need uh, to? The deadline's May 19th. Yeah. I could probably process all the information into like digestible format by like that Monday after that would be May 22nd. So everybody would have their little packs or anybody actually can read on the fly on these. So on May 19th, you can just go in and start reading all the grants. Or you can read them on the fly now. There are people that have applied already. But I can get like the data sheet and everything, like the score sheets and stuff by, where'd that go? May 22nd. And then it just depends on when we can have a, you know, a meeting together, right? So. And it's, it's going like, to be two, two meetings that, that we'll most likely want to have. Well, either, yeah, two or three meetings, one, at least one or two review meetings and one allocation meeting. So, uh, you know, we can look at, I think we can look at the 20th and the 22nd, 27th, just because keep it Tuesdays because it seems like we're successful with Tuesdays. I don't know. And we can, you know, always push notification a little later, but does anybody have any other ideas or input? I think if we can make the call on the top 50% by June 13th, if we have quorum, we can vote to approve that and then assign presenters on the 13th. Everyone will have read by then and present on the 20th if everyone can do the following Tuesday, which I think is what you outlined, Brian, in the guidelines. It just helps us with making sure presenters are there on the 20th. So, okay. I know yeah. people don't really aren't keen on like super long Zoom meetings. Is there any chance we could do like a four hour in person, get it all done on Tuesday and then a quick allocation on Wednesday or the following Tuesday? Still getting type of response for in person because of because of uh, COVID and stuff. So but if people are willing to change. So let me look at that what I wrote.
So we just need a, a quorum for Tuesday the 13th. And then we'll do a review on June twentieth of the like the for the final scores, right? So can everybody be there on Tuesday, June twentieth? The twentieth would be the presentations. Yes. The thirteenth is approving the top fifty percent and two. Correct. We would just need quorums there, a quorum of eight. So if we have Jesse not there. And Pete, but then we still have 11 members. So we would, that's nine people if everybody showed up. So with one to spare. And if Ron gets appointed soon. So what does everybody think? I should actually not slouch in this meeting. <laughs> Everybody's sleeping at my house. So I have to be like quiet and in the dark. Uh, the 20th is not ideal for me. I can definitely do it. I can muscle up, but I'll be gone for a long weekend and returning the 19th. Um, so the 20th will be hard, but, you know, not, not ideal. Maybe that's a vote in the other direction, but, you know, we have to do what we have to do. Hmm. So it looks like Jada can do the 20th. I can do the 20th. Jassy can do the 20th. Anyone else can? My, okay. hey, amen. Garrett, if absolutely necessary. Pete and Tulani, could you guys do the 20th? I'm going to be gone the entire month of June and possibly July. Yeah, you already shared that with me, Peter. That's fine. That's one person. So I think we should just focus on how I have it in the doc. And if it doesn't work, when we come to meeting time or things happen, we can we can be flexible. Um, so that's the update. Go, what is it? Sorry, I was just going to say the 27th is open for me, but the 20th I have events at work that I might not be able to get out of it. That's the okay. What I'm just looking at right now. I We're looking at it. least one, maybe two. Well, as it gets closer, we'll we'll try to we'll stick with, with what I have in the doc. As we get closer, we can be flexible. Um, because it's not, it's the business we'll take care of in June. Um. Any other thing? And we can, it's okay if we spill into July and doing work in the summer is on Zoom is not the most exciting things to be expecting. So thank you for your commitment to our council. Does anybody think we should move to close this section of the agenda? Okay. Thanks. You can start logging in and taking care of, like looking at people's applications that have already applied just to get them. You can download PDFs, it's a whole different process. If you have any issues or questions or anything, please feel free to reach out to me um, with the Arts Easy process. It's supposed to be easier, so that's why it's the easy. So I'll just do a little event report, kind of. Saturday is the Public Arts Festival. It's on Mother's Day. It's a community mural being painted. I'll drop a flyer in here. Um, it's in Spanish and English. Why won't you take my PDF? There you go. Um, I also send an email to everyone. Um, please share it with your networks. It's free. Come and paint a mural with your friends, family, neighbors. And then forever, you'll be 
immortalized in the side of the parking garage until they tear it down in 2130 or whatever, or whenever they deem it that it's, we're, maybe we'll have, not have cars anymore. Maybe everybody will be walking. We don't know, but it'll be there and you'll have a section, which is nice. Um, that's happening on Saturday. Uh, one of our funded events uh, is happening at Bombix this weekend called Collider Fest. So that's kind of cool. And what else we got going on? Um, summer concert series this year will kick off in August in Pulaski Park. We'll have two live um, uh, bands uh, called Thus Love and Peter Mulvey in the beginning of August. And then interspersed with some salsa DJs and some salsa, uh, live salsa dancing. What's up, Jada? Can I have some comp tickets? I want to go. I want to go, go, go. To where? Collider? All of them. <laughs> Summertime. Uh, you should reach out to Bombix. It's their production. I, I, don't, I can't get comp tickets, but... You can reach out to them, and then I think they're a card to culture organization, so they might offer discounts or free tickets to somebody from the in the card to culture thing. Okay. But I can put you in touch with somebody if you want, Jada, for Collider. But you should okay, come on please. Saturday. It's free. Come, come paint the mural. It's free. Oh yeah, that I'm gonna do. All yeah. the stuff we do that I'm talking about right now is free, except for one thing. So. Okay. Summer concert series, Pulaski Park, August, early September. And then there's some more city stuff. Masonic Street Live is the, the when we have portion off part of the parking lot next to Iconica behind Haymarket, that area. And we'll be booking shows on Friday from six to eight. Uh, if you know anybody in your networks and you want them to, if they want to get paid, not great. It's economic development money from the city. So it's about 150 for a set. Uh, send them my way. And I'll give them the Peter and we'll be booking Friday nights in June, July, and August. And then Sunday afternoons at Masonic Street Live will be uh, free salsa lessons and free salsa dancing from four to six. So a little early in the afternoon on Sundays. Um, and then there's a new endeavor we're getting involved with that um, between Northampton Brewery and uh, the parking garage. There's a kind of little parklet there. And um, we're going to have a stage there. And on Thursday nights, we'll have... Uh, like trios, duos, and solo acts on a stage uh, in collaboration with Northampton Brewery. You'll be able to like have like your own like drinking outside there, like good bands. Same with same goes for anything we're booking. We're booking for first night now. We're booking for performance, Masonic Street Live. We've already kind of solid like settled on our summer concert and put the park. We're also booking for bands on Brewster. It's called. That's the one at the parking garage. So if anybody in your networks are live musicians, DJs, or do any kind of live performance, poetry, whatever. If it's really cool and you like it, you tell me their name. Give me their contact. We'll put them in our list. We'll reach out to them. That's that's the that's it with that. And then performance is some of you've been there before. It's at Look Park. Uh, it's the third Tuesday in August. And it's basically like a cover band show. And we haven't chosen the theme yet. It's in the final stages. It's either going to be like elements or like weird science or something with that's open. But we'll probably have that nailed down next week. It's a fun show. If you haven't been there before, please do. And Jada, you can go to anything that we do for free, except for ticketed events that we like give grants to because unless they sell us, send us free tickets for the council, we you really can't use your muscle to get free tickets from people because it's kind of an ethics violation. <laughs> um, Brian, when uh, yeah. will dates and things be posted for uh, like the concerts and the salsa of the park and everything? Uh, soon I can share like a doc with you, but that's not for, um, it's not for public consumption yet. I'll, I'm going to paste it in here right, right now, uh, for, for a hot second. 
I'll just share it with the council. I'll go to your email thing. And you can take a look at it. It's kind of what we do. It's just, uh, it's been tough to like, we're getting involved in a lot. So you got to kind of got that. Salsa DJs will be like Tuesdays in August and the first Tuesday in September. And the live salsa will be like Friday, September 15th. So I just shared that with everybody. They can take a look at like what we got going on. We just don't have, we only have a couple contracts in hand. We're just flipping from this four Sundays thing. Like four Sunday was like three months this year. And now we're trying to change gears and really get all the, the thing, everything filled in. But I just shared it with the council. It goes to your email mailbox. You can take a look at it, Eamon. The dates are there. Just the, all the contracts aren't signed with all the different artists. So um, I haven't gone public with everything yet. Okay. Do you have an, a rough idea of when uh, you'll start like advertising and letting like folks know when the those days? Yeah, are uh, next week we're gonna start. We're gonna focus on um, booking June in Masonic and getting all the contracts for Masonic and uh, bands on Brewster, and then I'm waiting for imagery for summer concert series. But that's August first that kicks off, so we have a little bit of time for like imagery and marketing. But I have things in the works to get all the imagery and then those, the, all the contracts. And then when all, once all that comes together, we'll start making a, a marketing push. Okay, great. Because I think, um, I mean, the, the pride was wildly successful and there was like a gazillion people there. And yep. then um, uh, a lot of people have been excited and looking into it, asking when um, Summer on Strong starts. So I think there's like a momentum yeah, so memorial, like the more memorial we can like to... leverage that and say, here, here's all this other stuff that's coming, it would yep. just be the you know better beneficial for us. I think people have been waiting for Pride to come back for so long. I'm so happy. We were there. Uh, we set up a stage. Garrett was helping as well. We got a new stage, which is really nice. So that's going to help uh, the economic development money. We got a new stage. It's kind of super lightweight, easy to to to, to set up. It's kind of like the IKEA of stages. Um, mm. It's kind of it nice. was so smart to flip it and just dump everybody in right in downtown. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> they I were agree. making so much money, all the restaurants. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm really happy that that all came together. So we're off and running with pride again, which is great. So yeah, we're getting that together and we definitely got to get the marketing up soon. And the Chamber of Commerce has really stepped up its engagement with like local nonprofits to really like use their expertise in like digital marketing and um to get the the word out there to their audience which has been really nice because for a long time it wasn't there wasn't really really good communication between a lot of the local arts nonprofits and the chamber of commerce so we'll get that out there soon but thanks for the the reminder and a little push on that the other thing that's happening again this year that we're involved in but we just basically like do the stage and book the music is the taste of northampton which is going to be on saturday september 9th um so that's kind of my event report i don't know if anybody else have any events that you know you're involved in that you want to share tulani you probably have 12. go ahead oh. can i go say ahead, something right quickly yeah please you know, um i i am you know guys i'm new to this uh uh this uh whatever it is group committee board and uh i really have just been like going around a little bit like i went to uh the arts open house thing that they had what was it called open door garrett i told you but it was really nice guys i just went in because i was going to an event uh i can't remember it was a month or two ago and i just stopped by and then i you know i mentioned that i was here and i was just looking and they were so welcoming come in and it just felt like northampton is back or we're getting back and so it's a really great it's a really good great feeling and i was away this weekend or i would have went to the pride i went to a convention um, public housing residents. So um, it just, it just, I read all about it. It was on Rachel Maddow. Did y'all see that? She mentioned it. Northampton Pride. And so it was good. And she made a comparison that they're cutting pride uh, parades in many, many cities and towns. Oh. And we're going strong. So good work, folks. Any other events to mention or? engagement with events that was makes you happy or sad or not not much uh our okay. subcommittee met um two weeks oh, ago yeah. 
Well, this is new uh, business. This is going to segue into new business. New business. Yeah, I was going to say, like, it kind of could kind of fit in both. Yeah. Um, but we have a name for the event. It's going to be called, hold on, I want to make sure I, it's the Arts Cabaret. Nice. That's what we're going to call that event. Um, I don't know if you remember from last meeting, but we sort of had a couple people picked, uh, myself and Eliana and Anna and um, Joella. We all met together and um, went over what we think the event should be. And it's sort of like an invitation to a lot of the artists in the community that have been funded by us or that have uh, made, uh, you know, applied for us or whatever. It's going to be kind of an open party, send out a bunch of invitations. Uh, we kind of brainstormed a lot of ideas and like really worked on what the vibe is going to be. That's part, nice. part of the way that we got to that, uh, the, uh, the title Arts Cabaret. But we're really excited and um, we're really, um, you know, putting our putting our heads together to, to make it a really fun event. And I think we had talked about it maybe being in tandem with um, uh, perhaps another announcement of, uh, I can't remember now, maybe the due date for the grants in, in the fall, maybe around like October 5th. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. that so it's still pretty far out, but. I wanted to let the arts council know that we did some thinking and some talking and some brainstorming and it's coming along. It's going to be a really cool event. What's the way you're going to you're just, it's going to be a party. We're just going to invite everybody. Yeah. But party. it's a party that's more uh, based on the discussion we had, and this is still kind of an amorphous thing, but based on the, dis the discussion we had, it's kind of like a party with like, that you know, kind of airs on the side of a salon. So, okay. uh, the the theory now in its working state is that it would sort of be a, a display of art as a party and then periodically over the course of the night we would open up um many stages around the room uh where mm -hmm. people would perform or talk about their art or you know do whatever uh, you know artists want to do in that space and it would sort of be like in the round so you know uh, you know, at one time in the party, this sort of room uh, or this corner of the room opens up and there's a performance there. And then, you know, it moves over to the next stage, the next stage and the next stage is sort of around the, the main room. So in a, sort of a cabaret style. I, I told you guys we were productive, despite the early little stuff that went on with me. We really had a great time <laughs> talking about all this stuff. Yeah, it was cool. Uh, just remember to like. Keep them under fifteen hundred dollars. Like what? So because we have oh, to pay these people. Oh, it's already thirteen thousand now. Oh no! Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. no. We know. No. I know. All right. This is the time pay... in the. This is the we time to... in the planning process where it's just... okay to have I know. High, lofty expectations. Well, we're not going to ask anybody that we give grants to or anybody else in the community to to work for free and volunteer their no. art. No, okay, of course good. not. Just to make yeah. sure. Okay. No. Um, it would be and more then we should have a rubric for choosing you whoever want. you want to perform. What's that? Are you gonna have a rubric for choosing who you want, performs or not? Um, I don't know. Okay. And we we haven't really discussed that. Really, what we were hoping to do is invite artists. Um, it's gonna be fun. Yeah, it'll be a fun party. And maybe nobody performs and shows their art because we don't have enough time to put together a, <laughs> a bureaucratic method by which we make yeah. sure everybody is chosen. I don't know. But, but we it's have a, be a fun party regardless. We have a lot of production stuff that we can add to it, like, you know, like sound systems and stages and dance floors yeah. and things that we have within the department. Mm -hmm. um, so when you get it all together and a plan, just share with the council. And I'm glad that everybody met. And, uh, we can figure out a place to have this. Yep, we've already got a list working um, of uh, different different venues around the city that might work for it. Pros and cons, that kind of thing. Y'all have a date yet? Uh, we've, we're thinking somewhere around early October. Um, so we were talking about like October 5th maybe, but this was just our first meeting and it was um, kind of like vibes only you know uh, just trying to figure out what it is that we want to do and what it might look like and the things that we might want to incorporate and then we walked away from the meeting with uh plans to discuss um those things in further uh detail 
at the next meeting, which we determined already, uh, which will be May 18th. Speaking of May 18th, I just realized, were we just talking about May 19th? So anyway, our next meeting is on May 18th. Okay. Any other new business around the table? Well, yeah. So are we moving to new business? Yeah, we're in new business. It was like, that was like a segue. It was like events, new business. So as promised, I just wanted to raise the question that um, I mentioned via email from my conversation with Doris. So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts or comments, questions, responses. I do have a thought response. Is there a way that maybe perhaps, do you know how one time you and I met for tea? Do you think maybe we could meet her for tea? So this, I, Doris and I met for co for coffee. Oh, you did? Okay. And that's where this, we had a conversation. I got to know her a little bit as an artist. We And then she raised this with me. And I said that I would share her, her recommendation and some of what she shared with me to the council. And then I read at the top of the meeting, the correction that she sent by email. I do, I think as individuals, if anyone wants to, you know, meet for, extend an invite to meet for tea or coffee, I think that that's fine and allowed. Um, are you, what are, what are you thinking? You want to say more, Jada? Uh, I, I mean, I just don't know her. I mean, I, what I read the letter was very heartfelt and uh, I mean, I'm too poor to buy coffee or tea now. So I just thought maybe we could go you and me and then you'd pay for it. But um, I don't know. I, I'm I'll still too much coffee. Of a I'll take it a coffee. <laughs> I'll make it in our front yard. <laughs> okay. Well, I just feel like I, I would like, I, I don't know. Indiv I mean, I don't know. Or I, I, I would feel a little bit more comfortable with someone else. Cause I, I, you know, and, and maybe because I don't know what I wasn't a part of that. It may be helpful. I just, I was thinking one time I met with, I was doing something with the people from Leeds and I guess there was a big thing that went on and they were all angry. And I said to the people, I don't know what you're talking about. Tell me, I'll listen with love. And then afterwards we all did. So maybe y'all pay for the tea, I'll meet with them. I mean, I'm happy to send an email like introducing you. And, and I guess the question is, does anyone else, is that something that other people want to do? Does anyone else want to be involved? Does that feel like too much? I think obviously like we need to get Doris's consent. <laughs> um, but, but she expressed an interest in keeping conversation going with me. So I'm happy to like ask her if she's okay to invite others into conversation and share more about, you know, her experience. And we can listen with love. I think that'd be an awesome programming series. Listen with love. <laughs> and just well, the thing is, shut up and just listen. I mean, I could have, you know, Garrett and Anna. We could all meet with the people who met with our group. I mean, because, uh, you know, that was, uh, that was groundbreaking. And maybe we can just start with that. Garrett. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but if so, was there, is there still with the correction, is there still a, a question of does the council as a body do more or is that sort of that's in the rear view mirror now and like with the correction, that's not what she is still proposing. No. So with the correction, I think she very specifically, um, when I said she, she thought an apology would bring closure, I said for everything. And I meant her, you know, involvement in biennial. And then, and she clarified that she didn't want an apology for everything, but something very specific to her experience with like her art being called out with her being called out with, you know, everything that transpired in that first meeting, um, not everything that transpired, but how that meeting, uh, was, was handled. Um, and, you know, I've said, in, in meetings with you all before, like, I do think that she's kind of an innocent bystander in all of this. Like it, it didn't, she, her, she and her art did need to land on the front page of a newspaper because, you know, like 
our jury process was messy or our recruitment process was messy or like all that became public when it was like our messiness. So I do, I mean, I do think that's really, that sucks. And I also know that we've had conversations about like what it looks like to give individual apologies out. And, and then, you know, the list becomes like the length of our arm of who, who gets apologized to and how meaningful is that? Um, but actually I just see, um, Doris is in the chat. I'm open to meeting with any or all just need to be aware of open meeting. Yeah, I think it would just be like social. I don't, I don't, I don't know what that would look like actually. Maybe we have to check with Brian and the city if we're allowed to have coffee with people. Uh, so can I jump in? Yes, Tulani. Um, I'm actually thinking that this is a little superfluous at this point, um, in as much as you, know, you said it, like Doris's work has been plastered, literally plastered all over newspapers. She went to stand in front of Forbes Library with her work, um, but we are not encompassing the community or communities who are affected by that work. Uh, we're not encompassing uh, all of the other artists' work who were not presented because of our actions. And I think, you know, I think we do need to take accountability of the fact that we are still catering to just her feelings. So I think we need to acknowledge if we are going to have a conversation, is anybody going to follow up with Jason or any of our other Indigenous uh, community members who had spoken previously and ask how they're feeling? about this whole process, is anybody gonna ask any of our other artists if they want to? And as you just said, right, the apology like, train could go on and on and on. So um, I'm, I'm not open for uh, a, another conversation with Doris. I'm, I understand where she's coming from. I understand why we, why these actions seem or come from a good place and good intentions. But I don't believe that this is, I don't think it's our responsibility as an arts council. And I definitely think that if we were really going to stand by our equity statement, then yeah, I think if Doris is willing to, or wants to, or suggests to have a forum, then we would have to bring everybody else to the table. Thank you, Tulani. I, I mean, I will say that she named to me and also in email did, did suggest that it would be something that is useful for the community. And I know that we did get similar feedback um, like a year and a half ago when we were collecting feedback around this. Um, I think that as a group, we've kind of said, we wanna look forward and had a hard time imagining what a forum about the biennial could look like if we're actually looking forward. So I think that's where we got stuck and it felt like it was a new board with you know different interests. Kate, you wanna take it? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I'm pretty much saying what you're saying. Um, I, I'm i inclined to agree with Tulani. I think that it's outside of the purview of this council to mediate this conflict between between Doris and, and Jason, because it seemed like what her comments to you focused, are still focusing a lot on him. And I don't see how that's our responsibility to deal with the feelings between these two individual people. Um, and I do think a lot of the problems in discussing this we've had in this council is just stem from the fact that a lot of the people who were involved are not here anymore. And a lot of the people who are here were not there for that and do not feel, maybe do not feel qualified or do not feel uh, compelled to speak on it. So I really have my doubts about how productive endlessly rehashing this, this issue can be just in terms of substance that there, that us as people on this council have to talk about. Um, so I'm, 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 I most, I agree with Tulani. Um, yeah.
others? Yeah, I'll I just do see both sides. Okay. I just want to second what uh, Chalani said as well. Um, you know, as individuals, if we decide that we want to meet with Doris separately, you know, we we can definitely do that as individuals. But as the Arts Council, unless we're wanting to reopen Pandora's box and actually dive into this with you know public forums, which I think is not something that is advisable, um, it's best for us to just move on. We did what we said we were going to do, um, which was to write an apology letter. Um, and we addressed the things that we felt was necessary to address. So now, you know, almost two years later, we should be getting back into the business of uh, producing things under the banner of the Arts Council. I agree with you guys. I mean, I agree. I'm, I'm with the consensus here. I mean, I just, I, I see it and I do understand it and I agree. And I, I, I wouldn't, I don't know. If, if, if Danielle wanted to do something, but I don't, I, I don't know, but because I wasn't involved and if she wanted to talk, I would be open to listen to it. But I don't know if I do it, uh, give good service on behalf of the Arts Council, unless you know someone was there with me. And she may not even want that herself. So I'm in agreement. Any other thoughts? Um, a discussion that might be kind of easier for us as a council to get to kind of sink our teeth into might be about the future of the biennial and if we're going to do it again and what it's going to look like. I think that that'd be something that a lot more of us are ready and able to engage with. Um, so if that's going to come up in the future, I'm I'm totally open to talking about that. I know we're coming up on nine o'clock. Any other thoughts or suggestions? Otherwise, I mean, I know Doris is on the call, but I, I'm, I'll am i reply to her email just summarizing what we said, but I don't know if there's anything else that folks wanna say or suggest. Uh, should we make a, an actual motion on what our, our if we are formalizing closing our process on the biennial. I don't know if that's a thing. I don't know that that's the thing because it's not an open an open part of the but same say more to Lonnie. What what are you getting at? Are we are we are we closing this chapter? Like for for good. <laughs> for good. Are we it the, the, the few of us who are left, I know we've been we've been carrying this, pushing this stone up a mountain for a bit. Um, I would love to close this chapter. I'd love to, uh, I 110% agree with Kay and just ready to take on some new challenges, new experiences, grow, learn, and yeah, integrate our think, community. I think that's what everybody's kind of gelling around. And I think we're all saying a flavor of the same thing. So I think everyone's in agreement that it's, you know, chapter closed, moving forward, you know, lessons learned. And, you know, we've done what we've needed to do to close out or address the past one and, you know, we'll go forward. I, I hear all of that. And I, I will just note that I have a question of whether we, and maybe this is not necessary, maybe this isn't a concern that we need to take up and hold and feel is, is has enough repair been done with everyone that was harmed if to actually involve those audiences in a, a future program. Um, what what I'm hearing from Doris is that that may not be the case, right? And and that could be fine if that's what 
you know, this group decides to, to acknowledge and, and sit with, but I just want to name that that is a, a tension that's sitting here um, and be kind of clear about it. And, you know, the same goes for, you know, Jason, I don't think that we need to be in the business of mediating, but, but the question was raised, like, is anyone talking to Jason? I don't know. And I don't know if he has feelings about participating in arts council or not. I don't want to make any assumptions there, but um, just wanted to lift up what I heard from, from her. Yeah, again, it's, you know, the fact that we haven't heard from anybody who was, who was offended by the work, um, you know, and it's been, the rest of the process has been very one-sided. I think it's, it's hard to even consider a conversation if they're not willing, if, if the table isn't ready to be built uh, by, uh, by, unfortunately, like we're still catering to one person's feelings and I'm not, I'm not on the, yeah, I'm not, I'm not in for that. I, you know, we, we're a council, we have responsibilities. Um, and I definitely know that we've done some heavy lifting. I'm, so I'm ready to move on. Thank you, Tulani. Thank you, everyone. Jada, are we going to say something? Yeah. Okay. I, I just want to thank everybody for sharing. And again, I want to thank this uh, group for, um, you know, the love that was showed uh, to me. And uh, that was um, heartfelt. Uh, okay. Then I move that we close the meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Can we, can we actually do a um, uh, roll on it? Because I need I need names. Hey. Yay. Garrett. Yay. Jada. Yes. Amen. Yay. My. Yay. Shalani. Peter. Yes. Uh, Tulani? I'm, I'm sure she can't hear us right now. Um, and I'll say yes. I, I think that's a yes from Tulani. <laughs> She's gone. I'll, I'll yes. <laughs> um, so, so I think we are closed for the evening. <laughs>